God the Father crowns Jesus, but in one regard, the redeemed crown Jesus. Now, we don't crown him in all of his other crowns, but the crown that we put upon him is our response as voluntary lovers of God. God has so orchestrated his kingdom, he has so uh, administrates his kingdom, that it operates, redemption operates by the principle of voluntary love. There's one crown that God the Father cannot give the Son of God apart from our participation. It's the crown. It's the wedding crown. It's the crown of voluntary lovers. And it's the redeemed through history on the last day who stand before the Lord and they profess before all the angelic and the the demonic host, we love you because we want to, not because we have to. And on that day, we crown Him. The redeemed through history crowns the, the Son of God as the lover of our soul. It's a voluntary thing. Solomon, or the Holy Spirit in this, is calling it the crown which his mother crowned him on his wedding day. It's the wedding crown. It's the crown of the love of the redeemed, the voluntary love of the redeemed bride. And it's this reality of the Messiah, it's this dimension of our Messiah that awakens deep places in our spirit that no other truth awakens. And it declares that he is glad. It's the day of the gladness of the Son of God's heart. It's the day of the gladness of his heart. He was sorrowful as he entered into Gethsemane. This is the day of the gladness of his heart. Revelation 19, the wedding day, when the redeemed through history are presented before him and they say yes to him and the crown is figuratively put upon his head, which is the the, uh, uh, accumulated response of the redeemed throughout church history. Beloved, this is the greatest gift that God the Father gives us the power in the Holy Spirit to crown Jesus with love, the very love that God the Father put into our heart. There's nothing that you will offer more powerful on the last day than when you cast your crowns before Him, and the uncreated God, first person of the Trinity, would empower my broken, weak, sinful heart to give something to the uncreated God, Christ Jesus, second person of the Trinity, and it would be something that would make his heart glad, and it would be something that would crown him, defines my life with a dignity beyond all the angelic host. That we have the power to crown him in this way. The Spirit of God describes this as the day of the gladness of the heart of God. How does Jesus feel about this vast plan, this wedding plan? How does he feel about it? He's glad about it. This is not a a shotgun wedding. This is not a political wedding. Solomon engaged in many political weddings. He had many wives that were nothing more than political alliances with surrounding nations. He says, Jesus says, I am so glad about what is happening right now. My heart is ravished, he will say later on in chapter 4, verse 9. Why is he glad he's getting married? What is he glad about getting married? What's the thing that makes him glad? Because the ceremony is so fantastic. No, he's glad about you. You are the reason he's glad on his wedding day. You take a a bridegroom on his wedding day. He's been waiting and waiting, a long engagement. He's not so concerned about the flowers or even the music. It's the bride coming down the aisle. And the Lord declares his gladness over the redeemed from from all of redeemed history as they come up. The meaning of creation will no longer be hidden. The day of the gladness of his heart, the reason for which he has done everything through history is now apparent to all. For in his gladness, Revelation 19 verse 7 says, the bride is made glad. For we rejoice and are glad on the day of his gladness. Psalm 45, verse 8, calls it the, is the day of his gladness as well. Isaiah 62, 5, he is glad as a bridegroom over a bride. And he beckons her in verse 10 of chapter 2, come with me. And she answers uh, in verse 17, I, I, don't, I don't want to. Turn and go leap on the mountains without me. She turns him down, and we understand that it's because of her fear and her immaturity, not because of rebellion. And there's a vast difference between immaturity and rebellion. She is not rebellious. She's immature in verse 17. She goes, I can't do it. I don't have, I don't have the understanding and the courage to, to leave the comfort zone, to ascend to the high places, both the high places with the Lord as well as confronting those places of fear in her own life. Chapter three, verse one. She seeks the Lord and the Lord hides his face. It's the beginning of divine discipline. We looked at that last week. And the Lord's divine discipline is not his rejection. 
God's correction is not rejection, but rather he corrects us because of his affection, because of his longing for us. And we looked at that last week. Chapter 3, verse 2, she says, I now will arise and I will go. So after the season of discipline, it worked. The Lord wooed her out of the place of fear. He hid his presence from her because she said, I would rather have your presence than live without you in the comfort zone. It's safer with Jesus on the water than with the apostles in the boat. If Jesus isn't in the boat, that's what she comes to understand. So finally, in chapter 3, verse 2, she says, I will go, which really she's simply obeying the charge of chapter 2, verse 10. Go forth and see. She's challenging now the daughters with the same exhortation the Lord gave her in chapter 2. She says, I know that the mountains are scary. I know that they're frightening. The high places of the Lord is the unknown, the place of deeper revelation of God. It sounds romantic, but the journey can be perilous and even costly. She's beckoning them in verse 11, go forth in the same way the Lord beckoned her in chapter 2, verse 10. Come with me, rise up and come. And she said no. But in chapter 3, verse 2, she finally arose and she found a safe Savior. She was exhilarated by what she discovered in the Lord. And now she's telling others, you can't afford not to go. Last week we talked a moment about the price of discipleship. But far more costly is the price of non-discipleship. What it costs us not to go forward in terms of our heart being locked, our heart shrinking and dying while we're on, while we're literally living as born again believers, we live with a locked heart, a dead heart. That's far more costly. Non-discipleship costs us far more than discipleship costs. She's beckoning them, arise, go to the mountains, begin to seek the deep things, the high places with God. We are made glad in his gladness. Now he tells the, the daughters of Jerusalem, which he, she prophetically designates them as the daughters of Zion here. She says, you go forth and do what I did. Get out of the comfort zone. Begin the process. Go forth. Begin the process of ascending to the high places. Begin as soon as possible. Yes, the parable in Luke chapter 14, but I have a field to sell and I have a farm to attend and I have this and that. The Spirit of God says, go forth now and begin to ascend to the high place. There's always a reason to wait for another year to press into the high places in the Lord. Now is the day of salvation. Begin now. Go forth now, daughters of Jerusalem. She says, I wasted that time because I was afraid for nothing. It cost me more to wait than it did to begin the ascent to the high places with the Lord. I love the word, oh, in verse 11. Go forth, oh, daughters, this earnest This exclamation point. She's saying, oh, I want you to see what I've seen. You will be fascinated. You will be stunned. Your heart will be romanced by the Son of God. Begin now to go on the great journey. The apostolic intercession, interestingly enough, the 25 apostolic prayers in the Bible, in the New Testament, most of them focus on the necessity to perceive and to see more clearly. Action and obedience flows out of perceiving. The number one issue in your life is to see differently. When you see differently, you will feel differently. And when you feel differently, you will obey very, very differently. Obedience takes on an entirely different feel when you see things different. The apostles' prayers focused on seeing it's the doorway into the fullness of God. And beloved, there is no way forward and a heart tenderized in the power of God, divorced from a life of long and loving meditation on the Word. If you're too busy for the Word, you're too busy to grow in a tender heart in love. That's an absolute fact. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I meet people that say, the mandate's too strong. I don't have time for the Word. I say, well, then be a worker, but I would rather be a lover who will end up working far harder than a work. See, a worker will burn out. A lover will outwork a worker any day because a, wor- a lover is motivated by love. A worker has to go down the checklist. A lover has it memorized and has it written on her heart. God tenderizes your spirit in love. You'll do far more effective work with far less disruptions in the midst of where you're working because a worker gets offended. A worker, if they don't get their rights, they get mad. If they get neglected, they get real edgy. A lover is lovesick. They go, if you're mad at me, that's okay. I'm going to keep on in the work because I'm working for someone that you can't see. The the lover carries the reward in their heart. The lover carries the reward with them everywhere. The reward is the power to love. 
The lover will always outwork the worker. I look at people and they say, we got to do the work. I say, I believe we can do both. It's not either or. And if we do them in proper sequence, we will work far more effective and far longer. And we will cause way few, uh, many, many less disruptions in the purpose of God because we're not so prickly and we're not so moody and we're not so touchy and we're not so divisive when our heart is romanced in the Lord. And say when all the American missionaries left China, the revival broke out. Okay, uh, I slipped it in. God's not just looking for workers. He's looking for lovers who work through a paradigm of love. This is the Lord speaking to her. She's still immature. She doesn't embrace the most difficult things till chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And she has only said yes, and the Lord is beckoning her. He's calling her, in the words of Gideon, mighty man of valor. He's calling her dedicated. He's esteeming her life in the word, her ability to perceive, her lips of grace. He's calling her forth. Her weaknesses are apparent to everyone, but he sees that cry in her spirit to walk in the beauty of God in these eight dimensions of her life. These are things that will not only make the Lord glad, they will make her glad as she develops in these. Holiness makes us glad. I tell you, holiness has a bad has been, have been uh, dealt uh, a bad rap because... There's too much cranky holiness around. We need happy holiness in the body of Christ, which is the only real holiness that there is. That other thing is kind of a repackaged, made-over religious spirit with holiness terminology. Holiness is glad. There's delight in holiness. Anyway, he's looking at her saying, intimacy with you is lovely to me. He goes, I love it when we have communion with one another. That's what's going on here. These terminologies are stunning every phrase is god's poetic divine romance aiming at the heart in a way that even a specific a uh, the poetic language of god reaches places in our spirit that the line upon line left brain language can't touch and this poetic language of god's heart as i've studied these over and over i look at these and i go lord there's like four levels on every one of these. This isn't just like, this means that. It's like it means a number of them. And you kind of look up and he goes, yes, you're feeling a little bit of my romance. Yes, yes. And they mean many more than you can understand. So though you don't have to make chapter 4, verse 1 to 5 your top part of the book right now, but I assure you, if you take Song of Solomon serious, you will go back and drink from that part of the book before it's over, and it will stun your heart. And these things become powerful when you have a little understanding and they become a part of your prayer language with God when nobody's around you. Finally, now the Lord says, your eyes, your teeth, your hair, your dedication, your vision, your speech, your intimacy, one after the other, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. All of created order is stunned as the Lord is shouting, behold, your beauty moves me. And now she responds in verse 6. She's absolutely drunk with love. She goes, you really see these things in me? He goes, oh, I love you. And it's, it's real. Not only can he see throughout the end, he can see the end. He has the power to complete that which he began in you. Oh, I tell you, when he speaks these things over your hearts... Beloved, you, some of you are in this room, you're going to hear this, say, oh, that's a neat little Bible verse. I'm going to actually do some of the word studies and think about my friends. No, these are about you right now in your weakness, in your brokenness, in your struggle. These things will awaken your heart. Don't relegate these for somebody else or some nice Bible study. These things are for you tonight. I'm going to give you far more than we can cover because I want you to study this outside of the class. Let's, let's look at this issue. I'm calling it the cherishing heart of Jesus. Paul the Apostle said that, that he might present her a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, that she should be holy and that she should be blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives and nourish and cherish them just as Jesus does the church. And here's my point here, is that Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. Paul taught that the church would be glorious and the church would be radiant. The NIV uses the word radiant. The church will be filled with glory and will be radiant with the life of God. I believe before the Lord returns, His church will be filled with glory and will be radiant in love. The joy of love is what makes the church radiant. 
feeling love and from him and feeling love back to him absolutely changes. I mean, uh, it, it, it uh, deeply impacts her and changes her emotional chemistry. The power to feel cherished and the power to feel passionate in response is what makes the church glorious and radiant. The Holy Spirit will reveal the cherishing ministry of Jesus' heart in the generation of which Jesus is revealed as a heavenly bridegroom. And as I've said week by week, I believe that the Scripture teaches us that it's in the generation the Lord returns that the Spirit and the bride will say, come. There's many verses that describe the response of the church to the Messiah as a bridegroom in the generation that He returns. It's in that generation, particularly, the Holy Spirit is granted the, the uh, in the wisdom of God, the release to reveal the cherishing heart of Jesus, I believe, like no other time in history. And the church will be glorious and radiant as Jesus nourishes and cherishes His church. Paul reveals how Jesus plans to bring His church to radiant glory. His divided, immoral, bitter, angry church will be filled with glory and radiance. And he will do it by Jesus nourishing and cherishing. And it's the word cherishing. He is going to stun our hearts with his love for us. And he's going to fill his church with radiant glory. There's much revelation in the Song of Solomon about how he cherishes his bride. The cherishing dimension of the heart of God is the prominent theme of the Song of Solomon. That's the unique theme of this entire song. How does Jesus cherish us? By releasing His affections to us. By letting us feel a little bit of what He feels when He looks at us. When we feel even a little bit of what He feels, we feel cherished. It changes our emotional chemistry. The way He cherishes us, He esteems us so important, far more important than the angels. He beckons us into a bridal partnership that He invites no part of created order. He invites us and only us into a position as co-heirs, into bridal partnership to, in His embrace, fulfill the mandate that the Father gave Him to disciple the nations and then to rule the vast empire for billions and billions and billions and billions of years. He beckons us into that and in that He cherishes us. He says, you and only you are the one that I have chosen to share this great noble task of ruling my Father's kingdom. He cherishes us in a way that's very important in our lives now by affirming the budding virtues in our life. When we stumble in weakness, He defines our budding virtues. The enemy has worn down the church with accusation and condemnation. The Lord cherishes us by looking at our spirit and calling forth the reality of what's in our spirit that others don't see about our lives. We so easily believe what the enemy says, that we're hopeless hypocrites when we stumble, when we discover the weakness of our flesh. We give up. We're just hopeless hypocrites. We confuse immaturity for rebellion, and we just give up, and the Holy Spirit comes along and says, No, that willing spirit, what we've taught on week by week, He calls forth the willing spirit and says that willing spirit will bud into mature virtues in the days to come. And that's what He's doing here in chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. He defines her by the longings that he himself has put into her for Jesus. It's not as if Jesus, as if the Holy Spirit of the Father or just the Godhead doesn't see our sin. The truth is he doesn't see only our sin. He does see our sin, but he doesn't see only or mostly the sin of the redeemed. We lay in our bed at night and we go, oh God, I would love to be free from this thing I'm struggling with. And the Lord defines us by the longing of our spirit to be free, whereas the religious community will only define you by what you attain outwardly. Oh, I love the example of Gideon, and there's a number of examples. I'll just summarize it. Gideon is, uh, is uh, the way the Midianite army is, is attacking Israel, and it's a national calamity in, in, the, in the largest order. Gideon is hiding in fear. The angel of God appears to him. He's shaking like a leaf, hiding in isolation and fear, trembling. And the angel says, oh, mighty man of valor. The Holy Spirit saw in Gideon the truth of God in him, what Gideon could not see. And I developed that. 
that the Lord looks at Peter, calls him the rock. Well, he's going to deny the Lord. A little bit later in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, he's going to cause tremendous confusion in the early church because of his fear of man and his hypocrisy. But Jesus says, you're the unmovable one. You're the stable one. You're the one that others will count on and find strength from your stability. Paul the Apostle might have said to the Lord, yeah, but he denied you. And he even caused tremendous division in the early church by his fear of man problem. You'll find in Galatians 2, verse 11 to 13. And the Lord says, yes, I know. But in his spirit, there's a man of courage and he is a rock. And I'll go with my definition over him. I love the Lord's editing process. The Lord looks at Abraham after he compromises a number of times. In Romans 4, verse 20, he says, and Abraham never wavered in his faith. You go back and read Genesis and you say, well, Lord, look, there's a number of times he wavered. Acts chapter 13, verse 22 and verse 32, David fulfilled all the will of God. You look at the life of David and you say, wait a second, there's horrendous scandals and compromises. And the Lord says through my editing process, he fulfilled all the will of God in my generation. I said, well, in that case, I'm going to rise up and enjoy the embrace of God. The Lord sees the end from the beginning. He sees the seeds of character. He speaks to us with such clarity. Listen, he sees the end so clearly. He sees eternity. God has total insight and he has total authority. He not only sees the budding virtues, but he has the authority to bring them to maturity and to completion. He looks at you and he calls you lovers of God. The enemy looks at you and calls you a rebellious, hopeless hypocrite. And there's plenty of leaders in the body of Christ to confirm what the devil has to say about you. God looks at you and calls you the rock. He looks at you and he calls you lovers of God. He calls you the one that God loves. As John the Apostle uh, entered into that identity, that spiritual identity. As we looked at in the earlier sessions. Now that we have just a little bit of the background, she's in the journey of the, in the storyline of the song. She's only said yes. In verse 2, she says, okay, I'll go to the city. In chapter 3, verse 2, he told her to go to the mountain. She only went to the city. But she says, yes, I'm going all the way. She sees this new revelation of Jesus. She's preaching to everyone around her. You know what? It's really wise to get up and go. But you'll never have the power to ascend the high places until you've seen a king with gladness. Who's glad about loving you who sees that you will love him and your love is sure. You, He will be crowned by the mature love the power of God will put in your heart for him. Whether in time or eternity, you will be a mature lover of God. The crown is sure that the body of Christ will crown Jesus on the last day as the voluntary lovers of God. She begins to speak out of the sovereignty of God and say, He's a king. He's a glad king. He's a glad king about being married. He's a glad king about marrying you and the and the daughters are going wow arise every sacrifice before you will be nothing when you see the big picture of the glad king on his wedding day glad in the love that he has put in your heart for him it takes god to love god now the lord breaks the silence after the discipline he has not spoken to her since chapter 2 verse 14 he hid his face from her He's not spoken to her directly till now. And he gives the most stunning words. We would have thought it would have been a warning. It would have been a rebuke. It would have been something other than this. The king with a crown, with a big smile on his face. He walks up to her and he says, behold, you are absolutely beautiful to me. And this young bride is looking around thinking, well, I've only said yes, I haven't yet gone, because she doesn't fully walk this thing out till chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. But she said yes, and the Lord counts the yes. He knows it will mature in time. Imagine the drama of the hour. The great king. Imagine the greatest man. I mean, the, the great uh, fairy tales that are famous through history. The king walks into the town and... The young maiden who everybody has written off, the king captures the king's heart and the king calls her forth out of the great multitudes and shocks her and stuns her with the surprising cry, Behold! And God trumpets 
out of the heavens. Behold, there is a beauty you possess you do not understand. I am a glad king and I am glad about marrying you. And you will crown me with love one day. I can see it. My father has already guaranteed it. It's about my father's promise to me. You will crown me with love. And I love when I, I love what I see when I look at you. And we say, yeah, but we're still growing. We're still maturing. He says, there's virtues in you that you do not understand. They will mature mature into mature expressions of love. Oh, beloved, this is true. When he says, behold, it's a trumpet blast by the Holy Spirit. It will shake us to the very core of our being. When he looks as he singles us out, this behold is not a whisper. This thing resounds through all of all of created order. You are what I esteem as possessing the very beauty of God. You have captured my heart. This is the romance of the gospel. This will give us power to ascend any hill, to challenge any obstacle whatsoever. It's the romance of the gospel. It's called the power of divine lovesickness. It's the first commandment restored to first place. In the life of God's people. There's four reasons why we're beautiful to God. We looked at this in some earlier sessions. The gift of righteousness through the finished work of the cross. Makes us beautiful in the garments of righteousness. We already looked at that. We're beautiful because of the willing spirit put into us at the new birth. We looked at that already. This is just a little review. We're beautiful because of the nature of God's heart. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. To anyone else who had a different personality, that had a different emotional makeup, we would not appear beautiful. But to our God, because of the nature of how He feels and sees and esteems, He sees beauty in a place in our lives where nobody else can. It's, it's a reflection of the nature of God. And we're beautiful because of the, the certainty and the finality of our destiny as the adorned, enthroned, embraced, Co-heir, bride of Christ Jesus. God sees the very end. He knows where we're going. And He sees the destiny that we have in the gospel. And He sees the beauty already uh, adorning us in the destiny that no man can take from us. Beloved, our beauty is astounding. Now, we've now one day, I, uh, well, I won't do it in the series, but sometime I will. It's a fascinating study to follow the progression of the theme of beauty through the Song of Solomon. There is a very specific and biblical and theological progression. She sees a little bit of the Lord's beauty, and then a little bit of her beauty, then more of the Lord's beauty, then more of her beauty, and now the Lord doubles it here. Chapter 4, verse 1, like He did in 1, 5. He said, Behold, behold! He's shocking her. He's waking her up. He's stunning her, because on the last day, He will say this before all creation, when we stand as those that crown Him with our love on the last day. One of the crowns that make His heart so glad. Oh, beloved, behold, you are beautiful. This, this reality will wash us and cleanse us. It will cherish us. The eight virtues. By the way, by the way these are eight areas that reveal God's beauty in us. They demonstrate our beauty before the Lord as well. There are reflections of the Lord's beauty imparted to us, but they're things that make us beautiful as we stand before God, these eight virtues. These are eight things that make the heart of Christ Jesus glad, the verse before. When He sees us grow in these... But here's another thing. These are eight things that will make you glad. I love to talk about the excellence of purity, the joy of abandonment and total obedience. There's an exhilaration in our spirit. When we know there is no fear, there's no pull on the earth strong enough to keep us from our pursuit. You are liberated. You are alive like no other person on the earth except for those that are walking in that way. Beloved, 99%. Oh, that's powerful. But there's something in the final thing that's turned over where you say money, reputation, honor, convenience. Physical comfort, I care not, I am yours. Your spirit is alive on the inside when, 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 when we come to that place. There is nothing that I will say no to. Most of us say, Lord, we will say yes to almost everything. And it's that very mindset that keeps us 
experiencing so little, only the superficial parts of the superior pleasures of the romance of the gospel. Oh, it's fantastic. The bridal paradigm of the kingdom, the romance of the gospel will create a safety, a sense of dignity and destiny, a sense of abandonment in your spirit, in my spirit. These things will do something in us that will give us the courage to ascend the mountain that God has before us, that He's challenging us to. The mountain is the high place of the glory of God, and the mountain is the obstacles that create fear in our life. It's facing both of them, which are two sides of one coin. I'll go to the mountain. There it is. It's the great verse, chapter 4, verse 16. One of the great turning verses of the entire song. I will go the whole way. Now listen to what she says, and I have this a lot more in the notes because I'm nearly out of time. She calls it the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. It's very, very significant. Myrrh throughout the book, myrrh is the burial spice. It's that sweet, costly, fragrant burial spice. And we'd established that in the earlier sessions. He says it's going to cost you in the flesh. It is a mountain of myrrh. I want you to know that. It's not a mountain of western affirmation. You're not going to be necessarily rich and famous before all men in this age. It is the mountain of myrrh. It will cost you in the flesh in this life. But I want you to go, it is a mountain of myrrh. It's the sweet, costly, fragrant burial spice for which Jesus Christ ascended the mountain of myrrh in his own life when he went to the cross. I want you to take up the cross. There's two parts of the cross I have written here in the notes. Where? Somewhere. Two parts to the message of the cross. The first part is what he did for us. The second part is when we deny ourselves, we deny our flesh to ascend, take up the cross. That's what he's calling her to. And she says, this is a life. When she says, I will ascend, I will go to the mount, my way to the mountain of mercy, she is saying, there is absolutely nothing. I'm not saying I'm mature. I'm saying there's not one issue I'm saying no to. My time, my money, my speech, my sex life. Every single area of my life is yours. Not that she's mature, but every area has not one issue that she says no to the Holy Spirit in. That is freedom when in our spirit we say, after the revelation of the beauty of God, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. It's only myrrh to the flesh. It's only a burial spice to the flesh, and it's fragrant myrrh to our spirit. And in eternity, we see the wisdom of it. But she also goes to the hill of frankincense. And I have here in the notes, frankincense is the same as incense. Incense throughout the Bible in the book of Revelation in a number of places speaks of prayer. And he's calling her, he's saying this to her. If you're going to ascend the mountain, which is real big, you're going to have to have some prayer to help you on the journey. It's what he told Peter, and this is in the notes in, in uh, somewhere. I have them in the notes. Peter, he tells Peter, he tells Peter, you're going to deny me. And then in the garden in Matthew 26, verse 40 and 41, he says, Peter, you better pray right now. That's the hill of frankincense because a mountain of myrrh is right around the corner. And the thing that I, I love about this is the proportion. The hill of frankincense is much smaller than the mountain of myrrh. One's a mountain, the other's a hill. Here's my point. Even a little bit of prayer goes a long way in the Lord. A little bit of prayer goes a long way in the Lord. We ascend into the glory of God, into revelation far beyond what we really deserve from our prayer life. And we're strengthened before the obstacles far more with a little bit of prayer. My point is the Lord pays so well with just a little bit of effort is what he's saying right there. And I have a, a, a bit more in the notes there. Very important. She says, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. Beloved, you can't go on the path I'm going. I mean, the sense it's the word of God, it's one path. But the strategy of God in my life and the strategy of God in your life is so totally different. That's why people ask me, what do you do in these areas of the disciplines in your life? And I don't want to tell them. I just frankly won't tell them. Because I don't want them to try to do what I'm doing because they have their own way to the mountain of myrrh that is, hand, that is tailor-made for who they are in this season of their life. That's a very important part. And he says, after she says, I will go all the way. I will go until the shadows are gone, until the gray areas are gone. He looks at her and he says, you are, for the first time, he adds the word all. You are altogether beautiful to me. And she says, but Jesus, I've only said yes. I haven't even gone yet. She goes, I know, but it's real. It's real in you. 
There is nothing between you and me, and I will, I will help you walk it out in the days to come. He says, I see no spot in you. He's not saying that she's sinless right now. He's saying that there's no area in her spirit. She's saying no to him. Now she has just to walk it out. But when the yes is there, about 70% of the victory is already accomplished. You know, I, I forgot verse 8. It's a mountain of lepers and lions. I'm just going to mention that. It's, where, it's the call to spiritual warfare. I just overlooked it. The mountains are where it's warfare. He's calling us into a worshiping warrior, a bridal partnership. Worshiping warriors, lovers and workers. Because on the mountaintops that we go with him, there are lions and lepers. There's devouring animals. It's hazardous in the flesh, but it's exhilarating in the spirit. And we have that in the notes. I just totally overlooked that page. I looked at Oops. She never loses her spiritual identity as a lover of God, even in her spiritual difficulty. She is not a hopeless hypocrite because she's compromising. We struggle with the mountain issue that the Lord calls us to, the high place. Whatever the mountain is the Lord beckons you to in every season of your life, we struggle with it. Typically, by definition, the fact that it's a high place causes us to struggle. We 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 cough and we kind of... uh, you know, <clears throat> choke a little bit because the, 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 the mountain place is the place of challenge. It's the place out of the comfort zone. Regardless what it is, typically for a season we struggle. And it's in that season that we are still lovers of God. We're not hopeless hypocrites because we struggle. It's called weak flesh. Somebody might come to her and say, you're not, you're not pressing in. You're not taking that mountain. And she could have said, I will eventually. I'm not now. Wow, you're just a sinner. Yes, I am dark of heart, but I am lovely to the Lord. I'm a lover. I love him. I don't lose the testimony that I'm a genuine lover of God because I'm encountering my weak flesh before the challenge of the mountain. Every season of my life, there's a mountain that's out of my reach. That's why it's a mountain. It's a challenge. It's out of the thing that I'm comfortable with. And a mountain this year, two or three years from now, will be something that I'm comfortable in the grace of God with. The Lord will show me another mountain. And I've learned over the years that in between mountaintops, when I'm in the valley, in between the mountains, I'm still a lover of God. And I see myself as a disciple who loves the Lord. I'm not, I'm not a hopeless hypocrite because I'm, I have weak flesh. And neither are you and neither is she. She says, it's the one that I love. I'm a lover of God and I'm a lover, I'm a lover of Jesus. I'm a lover of God specifically. That's who I am. This is a statement of identity. There's this new hunger that's breaking out across the land where the body of Christ is, is just regurgitating the sweetness of the diet of the last 10 or 20 years. This consumer self-centered meism Christianity doesn't touch the deep place of our spirit. And so many of God's leaders have, uh, have succumbed to ear tickling where we end up just telling people what they want to hear. But the problem is, it bores them. It bores them, and they lose their ability to be fascinated in the Lord without wholeheartedness. God is raising up watchmen who have seen the Lord, who are in the divine romance, who are abandoned to the Lord 100%. And you are some of those watchmen. And the Lord's telling those that are coming after you, I want them to be rightly related to spiritual authorities. Be a spiritual authority that has seen the Lord, that has a history in God in their private life. Oh, I found him. Uh, 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 Number two, Genesis 32. Jacob was in trouble in a night season in his life. Some of you know the context of Genesis 32. He's pictured as wrestling. He's alone in the night. He's facing his fears. He's anticipating the danger of his enemy. He's wrestling with God and he's prevailing. And I'm going to... uh, uh, skip some of this, but it's, it's the importance of wrestling until we find the one. It's prevailing prayer. I want to press in until. The divine principle of spiritual hunger cries out. If we can live without something in God, then often we will go without it. However, if there's something in the Word of God we can't live without then we're going to receive it in due time. That's that. That's a, a rule of prevailing wrestling with the Lord. I'm going to seek Him until I find Him and hold on to Him. If there's something in the Lord you can live without, then you'll probably go without it. There's lots of God's people say, I don't really need any heartwarming revelation of the beauty of Jesus. And then 
I believe that the Holy Spirit's answer is, well, well then you, you, can, you can live without that. You can do that. But if you can't live without it, the Holy Spirit says, I'll give it to you. And there's many of you in this room, you're saying, I, I can't live without uh, experiencing this fascination with you. I have to be a part of this. I have to take ground. I have to start this journey. And the Lord's saying, if, if you're serious that you can't live without it, I'll give it to you little by little. For example, it's the privilege of every believer to have a heart tenderized by the Word of God. Well, then put your heart in the way of the Lord by prayer and fasting. You don't have to live bored. You do not have to live spiritually bored. I refuse to allow this reality unspoken to settle in on the people of God in this place that it's it's our lot to live spiritually bored. Well, you know, I was always kind of a slow learner and I got real mistreated when I was young and I never really did, never was on the inside of anything. I'll probably just live spiritually bored. I go, that's a lie. You don't have to live spiritually bored if you don't want to. It's not about how good your capacities are. It's about your spirit being built by God and it's acclimated to God when we give ourselves to Him. And the Holy Spirit will draw you to Him. Lord, we want your presence. We want our heart tenderized. We want the Word of God alive. We want the spirit of prayer. I want to feel the unction of God on me when I pray, in private and in public. But I want the spirit of prayer on me. I said this many, many years ago. I said, Lord, I'm not going to live without a spirit of prayer on me. I read it in a book. A man said that the spirit of prayer, when it lifted off of me, I would retreat in the wilderness. Charles Finney said this. I remember I was about 22 years old. He said, I'd retreat in the wilderness for a couple of days of prayer and fasting till the spirit of prayer returned back on me. I remember as a young 22-year-old, 23, I said, what is that? He would go pray and fast. So I said, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to get it. Then I began to understand what that means. And, what, and I'm not going to live without a spirit of prayer in my heart. I might have seasons where, where it, it's, it's lifted, but I'm not content to live like that. I'm going to feel the power and the unction of God in my private life. I'll say it again. You don't have to live bored. Because your friends say they do, and they call everything else legalism, because we're pressing into the Lord. That's a lie. I don't. Ha- I don't buy any of that stuff. I go. You can live bored and have your 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 false doctrine of the grace of God. I'm going to live romanced and lovesick and on fire, and I'm going to be in pursuit until I experience it more and more. We don't have to live bored. You are right now on a palaquin in the wilderness. You will ascend in victory. And everything that God does to beckon you out of the comfort zone is paved with love for you. And it will result in you growing in love for Him. And both feeling loved and the power to love back will exhilarate you and bring you into the highest place of any created being in God's order. Receiving His love and the power to to, uh, uh, to have the impartation, to give it back, separates us from, from the rest of creation. That is what's happening in your life. We don't have to be afraid of 100% commitment. Again, I'm not looking for a doctrine of the grace of God that frees me, quote-unquote, to live in spiritual boredom, to live in superficiality. I want to be wholehearted for God. I want to be lovesick. I want to fast. I don't want not to fast. One guy came to me one time and he says... I spent an evening with the Lord. He says, well, you don't really have to do that, the Lord, because they were all going out to dinner once, which is fine to do that. And on a ministry trip, a bunch of the preachers were, the speakers, I said, no, I'm going to stay uh, in tonight. And, and the guy said, you don't have to do that. The Lord doesn't mind. I said, oh, that's not the problem. I mind. I'm lovesick. I'm starving. I'm aching. I'm craving. I mind. I'm agitated. I want more. He says, man, I'm sorry. I said, I don't want a doctrine to free me to live in boredom. I want grace that it empowers me to walk in love. So there. I I hear that everywhere I go. It just, it just, it's like uh, uh, fingernails on a chalkboard to me. It's just, it's so gross to me. The idea that, that, uh, this, I'm just gonna go on a little bunny trail here, but this is such a great verse, verse 11. I gotta make sure I only got a minute or two left, but. It's the second Corinthians 3.18, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know what that's talking about? The Spirit of the Lord of liberty is the liberation of the inner man into the power of God. Now, I'm not trying to make a point about this. But, to, but today the cool thing is to, is to be liberated so we can 
you know, uh, go to the limits of alcohol and go to the limits of vulgarity because, quote, we're under grace or, or to dabble in sexual impurity and in and, and the movie and the deal arena. Well, we're under grace. That's not the liberty. It's, it's not talking about the liberty to sin and not be judged. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the liberty to be free from sin, to enter into a place that's unique for the saints. The liberty of the gospel supernaturally liberates us to live by superior pleasures. It doesn't empower us to live in the low things of this world using the bragging on the grace of God in a false way. Now, I'm not commenting on where God will forgive on those areas, on those issues. That's not my point. His forgiveness is vast. But when I hear those kinds of things, believers going to the edge of alcohol that's everywhere in the body of Christ, the whole Seems like church in the Western world is in a midlife crisis right now. And how much they can use vulgarity and how God understands the impurity that's being vomited out of hell in the media today. And well, the Lord, that's not the liberty we're called in. It's the liberty to walk in supernatural lovesickness. It's the liberty to be fascinated. It's the inner man supernaturally empowered with a divine life. That's the liberty of the gospel. And again, I, I see the folks in this, and I don't have all my little charts and rules on all those things, I, because I, I don't even think that way. But I look and I go, you're ripped off if you think that's what grace is about. Grace is about no one around, everything crashing in. You close your eyes and your heart goes, I love you and you love me, and I love being loved, and I love loving you. Oh, yes, I carry the reward in me. That's the liberty of the gospel that the Paul the Apostle talked about. The other thing, it just cringes at me. And it just, by the way, this church is filled with that. There's plenty of people in this very body that are lost in that deception. And it's called the grace of God. We don't have to keep the rules. I go, I don't even comprehend that paradigm. I want to call people into a place. I want to fast. I want to pray. I want to be abandoned. I want to go to the high places. I don't want to be free to be content, superficial. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to live in sin and be covered. I want to be freed. I want to soar. That's where God's calling His end-time church. The vision that's going to motivate us to the romance of the gospel is Jesus as a king with a crown, with a glad heart, eager to be married to you. That's what changes everything. She gives the thing that she discovered in verse in verse chapter 3, verse 4, when it says, I found him and held on to him. When she found him, I believe she found, verse 11, she found a God who is king with all power, who has a crown, who's happy, who is getting married, and she's the one that he's glad about. She said, if you're that glad about me and you have that much power, why am I afraid? That's the point. She's entering into the bridal paradigm. The king is crowned, a very significant phrase, with the crown with which his mother crowned him. It's a very, very significant phrase. And that's, I don't know that we'll get uh, much further than that. Well, we're at the end here. The mother speaks of the church. Here's the deal. There is one sense of which we crown the Lord. He's king no matter what. He has many crowns. But when the church says, I love you, we make him our king as a bridegroom king. He's king of, of, of the wicked in hell. But he's a bridegroom king when you say yes. And we, the mother, the church through history, the redeemed through history, we crown him as our bridegroom king, as a voluntary lover. That's the crown that he, des- he desires more than any other crown. It's the crown that makes him glad. It's the paradigm of a glad God. Glad about you and glad that you chose to make him the king of your life, the bridegroom king of your life, further as a voluntary lover. That's the crown that makes him glad. Of all the crowns he possesses, that's the crown I believe that he desires most. The one that you crown him with as a voluntary lover. Amen. Stan. That's why I don't want to. I don't want to live in compromise. I want to crown him in my life. I want to crown him as my king. He's king by the father's coronation. 
But he's king in a personal sense in my life when I say yes to him. I'm not afraid of him by faith. Of course, in my weakness, I back away. But I'm committed to get up off the bed and say, I love you. I want you, Lord. Amen. So, Nick, you prophesied that we're going to have a ministry time. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we want to crown you. Father, we know that you've crowned him. Oh, but in our individual way, we want to crown him as our bridegroom king. Oh, his heart is so glad. Beloved, he is so glad when a weak believer crowns him. He is so glad when you crown him king. On his wedding day, not just king, but bridegroom king. A king at a wedding. This is the revelation that changed her. She held on to him and this is what she saw. This will change the way you view obedience. He's a safe savior. He is so safe. He will not injure your heart. He will exhilarate you. Sin will destroy us. Obedience will cause our spirit to be exhilarated. Oh, Lord, we just disavow our fears. We renounce them. We want to be yours. We want to forgive the people angry at us. Just wildly forgive them because we're not afraid to forgive them. We want to just wildly, recklessly before you in love. Release everyone who's against us. Because we're not afraid because you're our king. We don't need all of their stuff. We need you, Lord. If they did it wrong to us, you're our king. We free them. We're yours. We're wild about you. If people want to take away our stuff, our hearts are going to be yours, oh God, because we have you. They can take away our honor and they can take away some of our finance and they can damage our reputation but we have you we have a glad god who's a bridegroom we have a glad king who's glad about me i have you god i don't it's not so bad if they think i'm off that's okay we can be yours this frees you to be wild in your abandonment to god this vision of the lord a mountain doesn't scare you if a glad bridegroom is the one escorting you on the mountaintops He has the whole military of heaven behind him. The one that escorts you on the mountains is the captain of the Lord's army. He has all the power of God at his disposal. We have nothing to be afraid of. Just tell the Lord, oh Lord, I love you. Oh, you're drenched in fragrance and myrrh. Oh, of the the wood of Lebanon. You came to me, O sympathetic God. Lead me out in victory over the wilderness.